You're listening to the TV Obsessive channel, presented by TVObsessive.com. Hello, welcome to episode 26 of the TV Obsessive podcast. My name is Ryan Kirksey, writer and contributor for TVObsessive.com. Joined, as always, by Cameron Crane, executive editor for the site. Cameron, do you feel like more tiger or zookeeper today? Oh, no, 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 I'm definitely not zookeeper. I guess, <laughs> I, guess t- I don't know if I, I don't know if I've got that spirit of the tiger in me exactly. Uh, you're, you're you're a paper tiger. That's what you are, Cameron. You're a paper tiger. Uh, I think that means something that I'm not sure I embrace. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. You, you, but no, you, I can't imagine being a zookeeper. I don't know. <laughs> we got some, like being some prison zoo- guard. Yeah, we got some zoo analogies to get into today when we get into. To Fargo, no, but how's uh, how's everything going? What are we doing today? Yeah, it's going. I mean, everything's going pretty well. I think it's December twelfth somehow already. <laughs> uh, time just keeps on flying by. We're going to talk about Fargo season five, episode five, and ladder after the pod. Um, as per usual, first talk about some things that have been in the news this week, what we've been watching, and and stuff like that. So. Uh, to be aware, spoilers for Fargo, but not for a while, and we'll give you another warning, like right before we're going to get into that. So, um, yeah, I don't know what what caught your eye on the news this week, Ryan. Well, can we talk about Golden Globes for just a minute? We uh, yeah. got some nominations again. This is you know, Golden Globes have gone through a period of of some interesting uh, turmoil and controversy, but it's still sort of a barometer for where things are, where things might go with Emmys and other other awards. The Academy Awards, obviously, for uh, for movies, but I wanted to throw some of these things at you that were nominated, particularly because it relates to some of the some of the shows we've we've been talking about. Just sort of get some general general thoughts if you're good with that. Yeah, let's talk about it. Um, there, so there are two main categories for television that have that there is the drama category, and then there is the musical or comedy category that have uh, six nominees each. I want to list off these dramas, see which of these you have seen, and of those you have seen, if any. Which one you would choose to win? So here are okay. the six that are nominated. 19, okay. 20, 1923, I think the Yellowstone spinoff prequel, right? Okay. Uh, the Crown, The Diplomat, Last of Us, The Morning Show, and Succession. Which of those have you seen? And which I just feel, you- feel like I don't watch television, apparently. <laughs> yes, yeah. I, don't, I don't watch award worthy television, apparently. Um, you know, we want we talked about The Last of Us a little bit on here. I watched some of it for that, and mm-hmm. then I embarrassed say I didn't haven't found time to continue. Yeah. Um, as has come up multiple times, succession. I do not watch, <laughs> did not like, do not enjoy. I uh I just have to embrace it. I am a hater. I tried to watch it two, two different times. Yeah, two different times, years apart, because everyone in the world is like, Oh, succession is so good. And I uh, didn't like it. Uh, I watched the first season of The Crown. That was probably like six years ago. Yeah, that's, that's uh, a long time. Entirely ago. different cast. <laughs> um, so you know, I've uh, I, I, I assume Succession should win. I'll get on board with uh, that bandwagon. I, I was going to say, I think Succession is going to win. I have seen Succession. I've seen Last of Us. I watched the first two episodes of The Diplomat. There was a lot of buzz about this show. It, it was not for me. I, I didn't finish it. Um, just nothing against Carrie Russell. She was fantastic. She's a, she's great in most of what she did. Just just didn't appeal to me. Um, yeah, and to be other- clear, that's how I feel about Succession. Right? Mm. I'm not I'm not looking at it and going like, well, this show is bad. Why does anyone yeah, yeah. like this? I'm just I'm just like, uh, I don't like how this is shot and there's a kind of like hand cam thing and I don't dig that and I don't care about business. And it's like, it's not for me. Yeah. Not for me. <laughs> yeah I, I think succession will win. Um, yeah, and sure. then, you know, I need, I guess I'm like you, I need to go and immerse myself in some of this stuff. I don't know. I just 1923 and the morning show, just, just the, those are obviously very, very different programs. Just don't feel them right now. It does strike me as odd that the morning show is on here because I haven't seen it, but I feel like the impression I've gotten is that no one actually thinks it's good. I feel like I, I feel like I keep seeing people like, why is it that I cannot stop watching this show that's not good? Yes. 
And usually, the, like TV critics, I'm talking. The about. the the prevailing sentiment around the morning show is it's a like the perfect hate watch schlock show, right? That's right. all it is. So how it's nominated, I have no idea. Give that the award. You don't give the award to that kind of show. I don't know what that is. You know, yeah. I, to be perfectly honest with you, like so, we can go to the, the comedy section. Yeah. I've got I've got genre quibbles, but I'll, you, you, you can list off the cat. Um, okay, good. Because I don't, I want to hear about that. I bet we have the same one. So six six nominees in musical or comedy: Abbott Elementary, Barry, The Bear, Jury Duty, Only Murders in the Building, and Ted Lasso. What are your quibbles? I bet I can guess. I'm gonna write it. Yeah, down. so it's like I so I, I, I think the bear wins for best drama. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I too. don't think the bear's a comedy. I don't I don't even see a justification for putting it under comedy other than the fact that the episodes tend to be like half an hour long. It's not a yeah, comedy I, at all. I, Do you think I, it's I think comedy? that's the primary motivation here. And you could say the same thing about Barry, that these are relatively short, traditional comedic 30 minute episodes. And I don't know. Maybe the first episode or first first season or two of Barry certainly was more comedic. Um, there are some interesting, funny personalities on the Bear, but yeah, to qualify these as as comedy it must just be because of the the length or something. Well, see, I mean, it's weird. Barry, I do think is a comedy. I I, I, I think it it's like very much black humor. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, it was, it was like pitch black dark humor but i i but i i would argue from my point of view i think barry is a comedy throughout so i don't have the the, the quibbles about that one necessarily but the bear i don't i don't think the bear's a comedy i really don't it, it's just, yeah. just uh i think it's a great show but how many times did i laugh over the course of the bear i mean maybe a couple like when joe mulaney's like is he still holding the fork? <laughs> so, like, yeah, it has funny moments. But, right, right. Yeah. I, I I laugh a lot when Fack is on is on screen, but that's that's usually about about it, I think. Yeah. So, so I would of give, those of those six, what would you give it to? See, th- but th- this is this is how it's all tied up together because it's like I want to give the bear best drama, and then I want to give Barry best comedy. That's what I want to do. Hmm. But I don't know. I, I don't know how to choose. Like, should I give it to the bear because I probably think it's the best show, even though I don't think it's a comedy? I yeah. I see that, that's if I had a vote, that is what I would do because I think it is worthy of winning a category. And if this is the category that they are going to put it in, this is what I would vote for. I have more experience. I've seen five of these six. I've never seen an episode of Only Murders in the Building. Uh, my wife and others are pressuring me to watch that show, but I've seen the others. And yeah, put up against each other, I would I would pick the bear. Yeah, but so then this one annoys me looking at some of the other categories. Oh, okay, there's Bill Hader. Okay, so we can give Bill Hader the acting award. That's what we can yep. do. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I don't know how many of these we're gonna go through. Let let yeah, let let's uh, let's do one male and one female ca- category. How about that? Some of the, the interesting ones. Um let's do let's do in musical or comedy let's do male in musical or comedy and then let's do hmm. well, i've got another couple here that, how is the curse under drama that's not a drama anyway. yeah we got okay all right let's do let's just do one more let's do best performance by male actor musical or comedy bill Hader, barry steve yeah. martin or martin short for only murders in the building jason siegel shrinking jason sudeikis Ted Lasso, Jeremy Allen White, The Bear, who was never actually funny. <laughs> no, no. Great. Yeah, yeah. De- definitely Bill Hader here. Particu- particularly if I'm not giving Barry the award for the best comedy series. I think Barry was, and mm-hmm. this last season in particular, I think it was exceptionally good. Yeah, I got to give uh, the award to Bill Hader, personally. What about, what about you? Yeah, I would give... Having not seen Shrinking or Only, only Murders in the Building, I think uh, particularly the last season of Barry, Bill Hader was just phenomenal. Um, I mean, I think Jeremy Allen White is incredible too, but uh, yeah, Bill Hader just, I, I think, laps the field here in, in some ways for this this category. All right, we're agreed on that. All right, more to come. We'll see what happens. We'll, we'll circle back when the when they are announced. 
when uh, some of the other awards come out. But just want to gauge your sort of your standing here as we end the end of the year. In the year, what else? What else is going on in the news these days? Oh, well, uh, I noticed that. So that there's this like wonky rebrand at um, over at Paramount Plus. Again? And, um, no, it's the same one. I just think <laughs> it's even weirder now because the news story of the week is that they're going to start putting some Paramount Plus streaming shows on the linear cable network, Showtime, as it has been known. And like, okay. You know, what would, I don't know exactly what it's going to be. It was put Halo on there or whatever, you know, uh, whatever they want. But apparently they're also going to rebrand the cable channel in line with the streaming service um, and call it Paramount Plus with Showtime. This this is the bit that doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> so this, this confused me because so I, I signed up for my free trial with Paramount Plus so I could watch The Curse and using it still. You go to Paramount Plus, you get a big tab that says Showtime. And so I thought I had Paramount Plus with Showtime, but apparently I don't have Paramount Plus with Showtime. I have Paramount Plus only. No, I think you have Paramount Plus with Showtime. It's, it's, it's not called it's, Paramount Plus with Showtime. It's so, this is like, <laughs> that's the thing. So they had, and and uh, it never quite made sense. They were overreaching, I think, because they had two streaming services within the same broad company. Um, first it was CBS All Access, and then they turned that into Paramount Plus. And they had Showtime as its own separate streaming service that you signed up for with just Showtime. Um, so when they announced however many months ago that it was going to become Paramount Plus with Showtime, mm-hmm. I thought, well, at a at a content level, this makes all the sense in the world. You know, people were making fun of it as a rebrand, but you know, if you're a little charitable about that, you can say, well, it's not even necessarily a rebrand. It's Paramount Plus now comes with Showtime, you know. Right. Um, but uh, apparently they're really embracing this as the name. And if they're gonna call the cable network this now, I now you're losing me, right? <laughs> because it, the you took the Paramount Plus streaming service and you added Showtime to it, Paramount Plus was Showtime. Makes sense. You take the Showtime cable network and you put some Paramount Plus on it. I feel like they should call it Showtime with Paramount Plus. <laughs> I think that's what they should do. <laughs> It's just like, network showtime with Paramount Plus. Soon I'm gonna have HBO Max with HBO or, or you know how how are, where does this where does this all end? Are we is it gonna end with HBO and, and Showtime or we got more to go? I don't know. I mean it's just it's just weird and clunky. And then you know, mm-hmm. HBO, the cable network is still called HBO and the streaming service is called Max, and it's no longer HBO Max, and it's like you know, it, it makes some relative mm-hmm. amount of sense. But I don't understand calling the uh, the cable network Paramount yeah. Plus with with Showtime. <laughs> um, oh boy, we're just anyway. That's what I mean, we're, we're, just, we're again. We're just moving towards you know three streamers one day that just all combine their names together. Yeah, I mean, okay, that's fine. <laughs> there was <laughs> there was also something in, and uh, uh, I can throw this in there. Uh, I didn't put it in our notes, but. They're also licensing some Disney shows to Netflix. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a list out there. People want to look into this. Mm-hmm. And so you're going to have certain things that are on Disney Plus, Hulu, and Netflix. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I think that's fine. I yeah. don't know. Personally, I always thought they were trying to go that this was an overreach too, like too many streaming services. Um, and the idea of at the end of the day, there being just a handful of streaming services that license content from production companies Mm -hmm. probably makes more sense as a model than each production company trying to have its own streaming service. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I I agree. There can be some cross pollination there and it's still, it's still work. That's what looks like what Disney's trying to do. And and I did see Lost is coming back to Netflix. So again, my once every few months plug, if you have not seen Lost early 2024, you can get it on Netflix. Yeah. It's been on Hulu. Yeah, it's been on Hulu. Yeah, it's been, been on Hulu. Hulu. Then there's One Peacock time. too. Since we're, we're I'm just going out of town to rant now. So the upcoming NFL game is only going to be only on Peacock. That's right. That's um, right. And it's like, I don't know if anyone's going to watch this game. <laughs> I forget who it is now. It's the Chargers with Easton Stick and like 
Oh, oh, well, people are going to watch anyways. Is it? It's not this Thursday night, is it? That's the Easton Stick, Aiden O'Connell Bowl, but uh, right? It's, no, it's, it's not the Thursday night game. Oh, it's one of the Saturday games coming up this weekend. Yeah, it's like one of the Saturday games, <laughs> and I just remember like, like, I don't know if I can watch that. I don't have Peacock. I don't know if I'm going to sign up for Peacock for that game. Like, what are you doing? No, no, you're not. You're not that desperate. You don't. You don't need it. All right, one more thing. You pointed out this out to me. I covered for the site a show called Lucky Hank. I know if you're listening, you've not seen it. It's okay. No one else saw it but me. Um, yeah, I was, I was reading some official data about this, Ryan, and according to the data, uh, two people watched this show. <laughs> me and me again when I was reviewing me, it. Me, I watched it also. It was, it was, you, you and I watched it. And, yeah. And uh, this no was just there. wanting, you know, wish casting Odenkirk to stay, Bob Odenkirk to stay on AMC forever, but it's been canceled after one season. Not surprising, but uh, I think it's, I saw it ended an 11 year run where he will, so we'll go into a year now where he is not on AMC for the first time in 11 years. Yeah. Who would have thunk it? I know. I mean, like, I don't know about you, but I feel like I've, I've, Bob Odenkirk is on Mr. Show. Yeah. And there's still part of me that's like, man, the guy on Mr. Show was just like a, <laughs> esteemed dramatic actor now yeah um, yeah well, no, we need we need him in something new hopefully uh hopefully it comes but no more yeah dis- but i did think for it's worth the people out there two things one i think lucky hank was pretty good and it's still worth watching you know i yeah. mean it's it's not super surprising that it got canceled because yeah it didn't really feel like anyone was watching it i was yeah. being facetious of course i know more people were watching it than the two of us <laughs> um and people read your articles, right? So like they were watching it. Yeah. Um, and I thought it was pretty good, but also like the way that the season ended really isn't terrible as an ending for the show. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that fed into the cancellation decision at all. Or if that's frankly, work. I haven't read the book, how this was adopted from a book. That's how the book ended. Um, but yeah, it's just hopefully we'll get them. We'll see them on something. Oh, yeah. on some they story. definitely had space the door was definitely open where they could have made more yeah um but for that to be the end not the worst thing in the world it's not like you're ending on some massive cliffhanger that's true <laughs> yeah the we'll never know if uh i forget the name of the college he was at if that the president of that college was fired because of their stance on the the israeli palestinian free speech issue but uh that's getting into current events a little bit too much so if we're not watching Lucky Hank, what are you watching? Yeah, man. So still on the curse, still on a murder at the end of the world. Uh, it's the penultimate episode of a murder at the end of the world today. Mm-hmm. Um, like it's already out. It came out, you know, at midnight Eastern. <laughs> so, you know, maybe some people already watched it. Um, writing on that, I'm out on the site. And uh, yeah, one more. So I'm curious to see how that wraps up. Good. Um, okay. Yeah, I did. I get through. I think almost two of those now. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna push through to the end of end of that one. Have found that to be pretty interesting. And then, yeah, I mean, I I, I don't normally send messages to people after I finish an episode of a TV show, but I did send you a message after episode five of The Curse. Just saying, yeah, what yeah. the hell did I just watch? <laughs> we need to talk about it all that much. Yeah. We're, we're, like, we're wow, what? <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I love it. when it's done let's <laughs> let's spend some time on, on on the curse when the show's over yeah i mean right now though let's hit on it again because i don't know that i'm feeling quite like it's it hasn't caught the momentum of the rehearsal yeah um the rehearsal really felt like it caught momentum at a certain point and uh, i was on it from the beginning um but more and more people were watching it mm-hmm. i the reason I'm mentioning that is I do think that there could be some value in getting on board with the curse before it's yeah. over, right? Like people yeah. haven't watched it all yet. I don't know where it's going. You know, we're about halfway through the season. It's a 10 episode season. Um, I don't know. M- might be worth kind of getting on board to be up to, up to speed as it hits the home stretch. Yeah. And, and to avoid all spoilers, I'm pretty sure it was, in your piece you wrote on this episode that there are sort of a tantalizing number of loose threads that exist in this show that could really come back in a pretty dynamic way at the end if they, if they want to do that. Yeah. There's a number of things that they just kind of like 
left sit yep. and not return to for a couple episodes. So, yeah. It'll well, um, on my end, I'll have uh, a piece up on Friday, uh, episodes five and six of Monarch. Um, the show continues to, to move at a pretty, pretty good pace. Um, s- s- sidebar, I s- went and saw over the weekend Godzilla Minus One, this word of mouth, just sort of a, a, amazing j- Japanese movie that's that's come out. Absolutely incredible. Go watch it. Even if you don't like Godzilla, go watch it because it, it is... It, it is Godzilla inside of another movie. It's it's fascinating. So there's my recommendation. Really, yeah, yeah. It seems a buzz um, about that, but then that that's not related to the Monarch universe. Is that right? Not not at it's all. Separate. So what happens is the the Toho Studio, the studio that created Godzilla, gave eight years for legendary Warner Brothers to create a series of films, and they said we won't do any during this time. That eight years lapsed. This is the first one they've done since then. So they're separate universes, um, but. This, I mean, they took their time in these eight years, and they made an incredible, incredible movie. Um, so go again, go go see it again. Quite, quite good. But be prepared to to read the subtitles. I had to tell my son that for, <laughs> to read the subtitles. Um, well, people so, should people should read subtitles. Yes, it's yes. it's mm-hmm. it's just fascinating. Um, and then I picked up a show which I've been seeing and, and reading about a few places. It got a couple of Golden Globe nominations. Slow Horses. You know anything about Slow Horses? I do know a little bit about Slow Horses. It is. Uh, uh, I'm about an episode and a half in. It is. It's. It's interesting. Gary Oldham got a Globe nomination for this, but I like it so uh, far. It was. Um, so I for the site I wrote on just the premiere. It might have been a three episode premiere. It was at least a two episode premiere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I wrote one article, just kind of like checking out. You know, we do this sometimes. Uh, um, and I think it was, I was trying to do too much, and there was no way that I would have time to continue week to week. Mm-hmm. And I didn't end up even continue watching it week to week. Although like, I thought it was pretty good, I was enjoying it pretty well. So yeah. So, so I'm interested. One, so one, I think... one article on the site I wrote that contains the most horse idioms i could possibly get into it i had a good time writing it <laughs> so i think the third season just started and so i'm starting at the beginning trying to make my way through it's a short first season so i'll i'll, I'll give you a recap at the end of end of that but um first first couple i i, I quite like so those are that's all on my docket for, cool. for right now in addition to fargo yeah, perhaps I should revisit it because I have seen a number of people saying really good things about Slow Horses, and it's one of those yeah. where I feel kind of bad that I, I watched the premiere basically and then didn't find time to continue on it. Yeah, uh, but you know Gary Oldman's in it, and um, you know it's, it's like a spy comedy thing. Yeah, spy, of- but it is it, it, the the ten second summary is the sp- spies who have screwed up. And sort of been yeah. outclassed to this place, and Gary Oldham is responsible for them, and and uh, how they're able to work within the confines of sort of the shackles being placed on them. It's it, it's interesting concept. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, recommend it to the world, and hey, again, maybe I should go back and watch it again. <laughs> uh, the only other thing I've got, I've got the final Doctor Who special. Although I, I mean, I say that, although I think there's also a Christmas special coming in a couple of weeks. Um, but this was the last David Tennant. Uh, Catherine Tate um, of the three. Um, I enjoyed it immensely. Neil Patrick Harris was in this one. Ah, okay. It was great. Neil Patrick <laughs> Harris in this episode was just absolutely great. Um, playing the toy maker. That's not really a spoiler, I think. That's just out there. Yeah. You know. Uh, and we've got, of course, now then the uh, appearance of the next Doctor. Um, Played by uh, Maguti Gatwa, um, and uh, he seems good too. I, I enjoyed him immensely. He didn't have any pants on. Um, <laughs> that's that's an out of context comment. That's interesting. Okay, <laughs> I think uh, I think I, is that a spoiler? I, uh, how fine grain do you want to get in your spoileries? Yeah, um, he appears for about twenty minutes, and he, he, he no pants. Um, I don't know why he doesn't have pants. You know. Um, but he's pretty good, and you know, overall, I think part of the point of these Doctor Who specials and Russell T. Davies coming back and bring yeah. back David Tennant and Catherine Tate for this run was to kind of reinvigorate the fandom in a way that you know certainly it died off for me 
uh, with the run with Chris Chibnall as a showrunner. Um, and uh, I'm, I don't know. I'm excited about Doctor Who again. I guess that's mm-hmm. the long and short of it. Yeah, I do hear people that that are Who fans really enjoying these uh, these specials. So yeah, that's that makes me glad to hear. And I'll be curious to see where it goes. And I just laugh at the people in the world who are writing letters to the BBC about Mm. it being woke. And um, (laughs) I I don't know. Uh, People listening to this are on... I don't know if you, like, you know, jibe with my sentiments here or or what. But I just... I find it funny. You know, it's like (laughs) people are complaining that Doctor Who is woke now. I'm like, hey, guess what? Now he's black. (laughs) Deal with it. Deal with it. <laughs> oh boy. Well, on that note, shall we travel to Minnesota? Yeah, I'm gonna get back to Fargo. So um Fargo season five, episode five. This one titled The Tiger. Probably not a ton to dig into with that, this title, but anyhow, <laughs> uh we'll, we'll get into spoiler territory here for everything that happens in this episode and certainly anything proceeding um in Fargo up to this episode. And um yeah, so we'll, as per usual, take about 10 seconds here, plug in some music, and we'll pick up on the other side with Fargo, Season 5, Episode 5. All right, we're ready to dig into Fargo Season 5, Episode 5, The Tiger, as you might imagine, a very dot slash Nadine focused episode. This episode is written by Noah Hawley, directed by Dana Gonzalez. Um, quite the cat and mouse game here in this episode, focusing on Dot and Nadine. She's on the run again, this time from a series of people. A series of people, Tillman's men, the FBI, the police, her mother-in-law, Danish, all the all that cohort are all after her. Uh, Danish actually has Doc committed to a mental institution where she escapes. Um, she outwits Tillman's men at that um, at that facility, actually causing them to kidnap another man when they were after her husband, Wayne. Uh, meanwhile, as she's on the run, she was able to find Scotty at Lorraine's house, takes her to Officer Indira's home, um, where the two agree to let Scotty stay there and form a friendship that may go on to help both of them throughout the rest of this season. Um, meanwhile, in the one scene without Dot and Nadine uh, in this in this episode, we have our first confrontation between Lorraine and Roy, where they go head-to-head trying to decide who has property rights over Dot. Is it Wayne or is it Roy as the original husband? A um, lot to look into this this episode again. Very heavy on Dot and Nadine. Where do you, where do you want to start? Yeah, well, just to throw in there, you know, the, there's also the scene with Lorraine where she's at the lunch or whatever with the guys with the bank where she kind of yes. puts them in their place. So you had a little bit of a through line with Lorraine kind of exerting her power, um, mm-hmm. which I enjoyed. Very so, much so. you know, there, that there's a wrinkle there. You know, it was like interrogate my own emotional responses where you yeah. have this woman, Lorraine, Played wonderfully by Jennifer Jason Lee, of course, but in Absolutely. terms of the character, uh, I would view her as very much an enemy in the world, uh, personally, and yet uh, put her in the right circumstances where she's um, putting these men in them in their places, and yeah. I find myself kind of like, yeah, get them. <laughs> There's also the scene she has with Officer Indira, which we we can't forget as well, where she talks about, you know, being a zookeeper and how the debt is her cage and yeah. and, and all of that. So she's she, she's very much about putting people beneath her so they can understand her position. Yeah, but see, that one I don't like. That yeah. one I think she's being mean. And like in, yeah. in that one, they like, stop being mean to, to, to Indira, you know. So there's like certainly a gendered aspect to yeah. it. It's not her fault. It's her yeah. fault. <laughs> yeah well like the, when, when she's when it's like some cocky man like roy tillman coming in there and she's kind of slaps him down you know kind of like yeah that's you know uh, i'm on your side in this moment yeah but yeah, yeah when, she's, exactly. when she's talking down to indira i'm like yeah oh my god here yeah get evil, the husband in here husband debt in here. collector right yeah. exactly exactly uh, 
I mean, it, I mean, it is a dear husband's fault. Too, by the way. Well, it is. I was talking about her husband uh, here uh, along the way. Um, yeah, we just got to kind of decide how to work through this. So you say a lot of it is not. Yeah. I mean, she's institutionalized. She attacks the orderlies and all of this. It's kind of entertaining. They don't. They don't show us really. Let, let me ask you. Let me ask you a question about Dot, since we can start there. Since this episode called the Tiger, we have this sort of at the very beginning where she roughs up one of the orderlies at the mental hospital. Um, she smothers one of the guys at at. Uh, she's trying to swap rooms with. Was she enough of a tiger in this episode for you? I, I, I don't know. Maybe I kind of expect a little bit more. I don't know. I don't know if it's more violence or more. Or more cunning or what, but she, was she was she a real tiger for you in this episode? Yeah, no, I think I see what you mean. Maybe the voiceover narration mm. um raises expectations too high yes. or something. That's true. Um her actions back in I want to say episode one, whenever she was kidnapped, right? Yes. Yes. There was almost she was almost fiercer in my exactly. Mind. Than she has been since, even in the home invasion last episode, you know. Yep. Um, but you know, for the most part, yeah. Um, she tries to keep them from taking her in the first place. She fails, mm-hmm. um, but then she is able to um, turn the tables on the guy who's trying to strap her down, <laughs> and uh, apparently also does some violence against that nurse whose uniform she stole. We we don't see that, right? There's Good point. little things yep. we don't see. Um, and then whatever the guy's name is, who's a bit of a jerk, uh, who she smothers. I don't think she kills him. I was I wondering, so. like, yeah. I, during that scene, I was like, is she killing this guy? <laughs> yeah, I was worried, but I don't think she did. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think she did. Um, she switched the nameplate. That's a big thing that you know, occurs here that could be of relevance moving forward. Because it would seem like Roy's men fall for it. And we don't quite see this, but I presume they kidnap the wrong guy. Yeah, I think they we, we see them wheel out someone and it's the guy that she smothered because that's whose name she swapped with, with Wayne. And, and again, it was interesting to me because I'm glad you brought this up because the nurse working at the front desk had just pointed to them where where Wayne where his room was yeah and so you know we had this whole situation where Gator had to stay in the car he was not a part of this these these guys working for Roy are are, are not he, he needs a new crew of people because there's not not one of them even the hired gun can can handle a one job like kidnapping the husband or bringing in dot so yeah b- b- these guys are not 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 the best henchmen i've ever seen no and they fall for it i get yeah here's an interesting parallel uh here she switched the nameplates on the doors mm-hmm. they actually go to the right door but <laughs> yes. are are fooled by the name exactly on the door and that's in parallel to how they were fooled by her uh, uh street side shenanigans Right, they have the GPS yep. telling them where to go, but they're looking at the street signs. So trust I mean, the, it does trust the authority. That's the lesson here. Trust the authority. Maybe, yeah, or it's it's <laughs> it's playing with something um, along those lines, which is kind of interesting. I don't know if it's terribly deep, but have you ever had this experience? Like, you look at your phone app, you're looking at the weather, yep. and 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 it says that it's not raining. And it is raining. You're like, the, yeah. the weather's wrong. You're like, I want to trust the app, <laughs> yeah. what the app says, you know, like right, right, right. short circuited in the wrong direction, sort of. I, I do like um, the, if it is at all an intentional sort of juxtaposition that they're asking you to, you know, okay, believe the nurse who told you the right thing, believe the app that's supposed to have, give you the right way. But this whole show, as we've talked about ad nauseum, is about just the corruption of authority and how the people in charge are, are truly, truly awful. Yeah. And so, I mean, I guess then it's this, it's the space of that question, at least. I don't know if it's taking a strong position necessarily, but here it would be. Yeah. Do you trust the person who told you what room to go to, or do you trust the sign 
yeah. on the on the door of the room. I don't know if it's an easy question, actually, right? <laughs> yeah. Maybe the person was wrong. And so on. Um, but yeah, it seems they, they kidnapped the wrong guy. Should have just given Munch's money. You know, no. you're talking about Benjamin not being good. Munch was good. Munch was Munch was good. I, I I put this in the notes. Very sad to see no um I heard someone pronounce it this past week as monk. Ole monk. Like that's the that's the official German way to say it. So no monk in this episode. I don't know. Do they say it in the show? I he's think not, it was he's... in a sense of when he was talking about himself when he was sitting in the bath of he talked about himself as monk. Maybe he's a monk. Well, I don't know. I'm not gonna I think he's <laughs> Welsh too. I don't think he's German. I think he's Welsh. <laughs> yes. We're but we're we're getting a little bit too much into the territory of people who insist on saying like Vincent Van Gogh. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm an American. And I'll anglicize your name. Don't <laughs> not Alex Trebek or something. Yeah, no, they uh, it, would, it would have been a much better place. Probably they just put uh, put Munch on 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 the job here. But they, I mean, they they take the well, what they think is the husband, in a way to try and blackmail, uh, capture, get back at uh, get back at Dot Nadine. But she obviously here's a plans. here's a little question in there. Um, because there's a wrinkle to where, because Gator's not been good, because he keeps failing, mm-hmm. uh, he's told to wait in the car. Yes, He does ultimately come in because he seems the FBI. But here's my question, and I'm not sure without going back and rewatching things. Does Gator know what Wayne looks like? He never saw him in the house, from what I right? recall. He was, uh, they were hiding time, in the attic. Yeah, by the time he made it up there, Nadine already pushed him off the roof. So I don't think he knows what he looks like. He must not, because he because they do wheel out the wrong guy. And Gator looks back at her, you know, and gives her the, you know, you better not say anything. Um, so he must not know, or he didn't pay attention to the person that you're wheeling out. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I guess yeah. Just, just realizing because he was in the house, but yeah, maybe yeah. the way that that played out exactly, uh, he never really saw Wayne. Yeah. Uh, another question: Is Wayne still in the bathroom? He's got to be. <laughs> <laughs> she said, "Don't come out till I talk on the door." Yeah. Okay. <laughs> He's still, still, still sitting in there. Hours later, I guess. One of matches. Yeah, and nurse comes by eventually. Yeah. But he's locked the door. I mean, I think probably unlocked the door. Um, yeah, interesting dynamics, as you say. Then um, she ultimately dot. She gets Scotty. Yes. Um, more incompetence, right? Danish yelling at the security guy um, who was insisting on seeing his ID. Well, mm-hmm. he just let Dot sneak in, and maybe they don't know that, but they know Scotty's missing. They know she's yeah. missing. Yep. Um. And are maybe putting it together by the end of the episode with the information that Dots escaped from the hospital. That uh, I think that's certainly him. certainly right. That's that's the way I read it. Yeah. What do you think of this when she goes to Indira's and convinces her to watch Scotty for a while? Like, yeah. What, what do you What do you think of Indira agreeing to do that? Yeah, I think that there are. I guess if we sort of look past, we haven't seen much of Officer Wit lately in these past two or three episodes. If we look past him, there are basically two endearing characters on this show, right? Or two characters you can try to empathize with, right? We don't know much about Dot Dot's background, but we have the sense of she's being hunted by someone who considers her his property. So we we sort of feel for her in that way. Indira, you know, I I struggle with this because clearly she's in this awful, awful situation where she's whatever Lorraine said, you know, hundred something thousand dollars in debt. Um, How much of it did she do herself versus how much her husband has done? But she understands, it seems like, what it would take to help move past that situation. But she's just been unwilling to to confront her her husband. So there's this one sense of, well, you know, the right thing to do. But also as a, someone who is apparently a you know a, a good spouse, you crush your husband's crush your husband's dream, right? So I thought that these two kind of needed to get together because 
they're the sympathetic characters. They're the ones that are trying to, whatever the right thing is in this universe, are the ones trying to do the right thing. So I, I wasn't surprised that someone who has, seems like a heart and soul like a deer would agree to take on S- Scotty, even with everything else she's got going on. Yeah. It was interesting to me how it played out. Like, ultimately, I think it works, but it's almost as though when her husband, whose name is Lars, Lars, <laughs> um, the Lars the golfer, uh, <laughs> like when he comes up and kind of interrupts their conversation, something about how he does that seems to have switched something in, in Dira's mind. And it, it landed for me, but just kind of thinking about well, what that was exactly i think part of it also was the conversation with the rain where the rain is basically explained to her it doesn't matter how much you did how much your parents did how much your husband's doing you're in a cage i'm the one because i sort of have this over you that i can lord over you this debt these things that you owe you can't get out and even if you think you can get out i can figure out a way for you to stay in it and for your children to stay in it and their children to stay in it and so she is now thinking, how do I sort of take control of this situation? And it seems like she wasn't ready to in the moment in front of Dot, but she's seems like she's almost ready to confront her husband about about what he's doing. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's that. Or it's also like, why am I playing by the rules? And mm-hmm. that's in the background, Lorraine talking about being trapped in this cage. And it's interesting with that, you know, I mean, because on the one hand, yes, but there's also a question of how seriously do you take that, as it were. And you've got the debt collectors calling you. Mm-hmm. Um, to my understanding, like that's about as far as they can go. They can bother you incessantly, right, right? Right. But they're trying to just play on that. Oh, well, you owe, right? And that feeling that you owe. And we're just going to keep reminding you over and over and over again. Um to what extent is she because what she says to dot is something like i can't watch your kid i'm yeah. a cop exactly you know your kid's missing um you know i can't hide your kid and so she she seems to make this move where she decides no screw it i'm gonna do it yeah screw, screw what those rules are and how those rules feed into the benefit of people like lorraine perhaps yeah. specifically is on her mind um, I, do like, do I, I do like that angle the angle of I've tried to do the right thing for so long and it's gotten me $150,000 in debt right try to put myself through school try to stay committed to this person tried to you know be a, an upstanding officer of the law and it's gotten me nowhere so now even though it's, it's the right thing to do I'm going to step outside that box for a while and, and do something that, that will benefit myself and someone that I care about yeah, or if it does. But I mean, yeah. I also got yeah. the feeling like part of her motivation was to kind of piss off her husband. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know if she's going to confront him about, you know, his um, golf habit and <laughs> delusions yeah, um, or, or what have you. But uh, his reaction is like, what What do you mean? This girl's going <laughs> to stay with us? An actual girl or a <laughs> real girl? <laughs> yeah. Um, I wonder how he's going to factor in down the line noting the actor here is lucas gage Mm -hmm. i don't know that he is a big name star or anything but i recognize him do you recognize him i recognize him i I couldn't put a finger on where where he has been and what he's done uh but yeah he's not a he's not a background character or background actor i mean sort of maybe well i can tell you one place you recognize him from which is the white lotus he was in White Lotus. Season what one. season was he in? He was in season one. Gosh, who was he? I'm trying to think. He was like um, a worker at the hotel, and oh. uh, Armand ended up, you know. Oh gosh, yes. Okay, yes. <laughs> in the, yeah, Say no more. in his office with the. Say you know, no more. The, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, he was uh, he was in that so yeah I mean I don't know but I'm curious how um, how he that character here might factor into to where things are going um, very hard to predict being Fargo other than I predict messiness and chaos yeah oh absolutely that's absolutely coming 
Um, and I think it's going to come to, you know, as is standard with Fargo, to most, not just some, most of our characters. Um, and certainly Dot is not done with her her chaos, nor is Roy, nor nor is Wayne. And I think Indira is stepping into that, <laughs> to those chaotic waters as well. Yeah. Um, a couple of other things, some of this factors into things you mentioned before, so I don't know how much you want to talk about it. Um, this bit where, so Roy comes to see Lorraine. Yeah, this was a good scene. And, you know, he's saying, Dot, her name's Nadine, that's my wife, she's my property. Which is it, interesting to me, I didn't know, like, I used that phrasing in talking about this weeks ago. This might be the first time he actually did. It was just clear to me that's how he views it, you know. Um, but Lorraine says she's been it's been more than seven years, so she's officially declared dead after seven years. Um I'm not claiming any expertise on this, but I did try to look into this a bit. It's one of those things mm-hmm. that's out there in the world as almost a cliche trope sort of thing. I and see. there's something to it, but I do believe someone has to do that. It doesn't just happen, except for like the Social Security Administration. Someone has to do the act of disappearing or has to do the do what? The declaration of death. Oh, I see. Okay. So like, at least in terms of what I read, the Social Security Administration, if they've if you've been missing for seven years. And they're like, well, we're just going to take you off the books here. <laughs> you know, like we're we're we're, we're going to decide that you're dead for the purposes of, you know, the accruing of Social Security or, or yeah. what have you. Um, beyond that, from what I read, and I think this is probably right. You know, again, I'm not an expert or a lawyer by any means. Yeah, one would have to um, go through some process to get that declaration, right? So, like, say. Um, I don't know, uh, say your father's been missing for seven years mm-hmm. and you want to inherit his property. I see. You go and get him declared dead so that you can inherit the property, right? That sort of thing. In, in other words, I, I think that there is a little wrinkle here that it's not officially like um, Nadine would be declared dead after seven years if no one took the time to do that. To do, to do it. So I, I feel a theory coming on. This is this is there was something churning here. Um, does Dot help Indira understand how to disappear for seven years? You know, somehow the debt gets. You know, she's like, all right, we're going to consolidate it under both of our names, me and me and Lars here, and then she teaches her how to disappear, and so she can escape her debt after after that period of time. We got theory working here. Uh, maybe, but I think you just declared <laughs> bankruptcy. Yeah, <laughs> um, I think that's a seven-year period. I, uh... Anyway, I just I wanted to mention this. I don't know how much it's going to matter, but I think it's kind of interesting to think about to tie into how. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, let's say even if this were the case, Roy Tillman doesn't care, yeah. but the fact that he doesn't care about how those official rules and federal laws and stuff work maybe also means that he doesn't quite know that what Lorraine says isn't really true. Yeah. You know, um, and, and I don't think it is because yeah. she's trying to claim that his marriage is nullified because she's been missing for seven years. I don't right. think that's true. I don't think so and, either. In, unless someone had, like him, gone to get her officially declared dead yeah, so that he could remarry. And why would he have done that if he's hunting for her? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. There, there is that hiccup. I mean, not hiccup, wrinkle, whatever conceptual metaphor I want. That he is yeah. married again. So, how, what exactly went down? Again, I've looked at the theory yeah. before. She faked was... her own death. This would seem to indicate that she did not fake her own death. That she's so not. That, that 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 is certainly the sense I have as well. And then, you know, I guess from this conversation, just on maybe the most fundamental level, is that people in these positions consider someone like this or those that they th- that are beneath them as i mean l- this is them talking about her as literal property that you know, they, these people are something that can be bargained for can be used as 
trade ships, can be pawn pieces, can be whatever they want them to be, because we're again, you know, back to this theme every week, we're in these positions of power. And so we're now talking about a literal person as a literal piece of property. Um, it just sort of slaps you in the face in that, in that scene quite a bit. Yeah. And it's interesting because I, I do think that Lorraine is basically saying she does not want to view it that way. But if you insist on viewing it that way, mm-hmm. um, I will smack you down and win <laughs> legally. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and then from the other side, uh, Roy's position is basically, I don't care about it legally, morally. Right. She's right. my property in like the eyes of God. Or what, the old, what the Old Testament tells me is that she is mine. Yeah. Um, so, it's an, it, it, yeah, it, it's an interesting kind of con- contrast. Yeah. I don't know what he's going to go off and do now. I'm not entirely sure what Dot's going off to do now. And we don't know. You know that's, doing. that's one of the fascinating things about this season is I can't really guess. I mean, I sort of, we sort of knew that the home invasion piece was coming, but I can't really guess from episode to episode what's what's coming next or where they're going to go and what's going to what's going to happen. But that's been a good thing so far. Right. So like at the end is is Dot off to um, try to kill Roy? That yep. was what Felicia yep. speculated in the recap she wrote uh, for the site this week. This um, won't stop until I stop him. Yeah, and I guess that makes sense. Yeah. So so maybe that's what's going on. Um, what did you think of the narration? And did you notice who was doing the narration? I did not notice this until you put it in our, our notes. Who, who is, who's the narrator here, if you can share? So uh, Jason Schwartzman. Interesting. Okay. I find I, this interesting. I, I found it interesting because it was, I, I liked the description of, he was obviously describing this, you know, this tiger, this aspects of what a tiger is, what they do, who they are, um, their features and how it equated to what was happening uh, with, with Nadine on, on the screen. I, this is I'm trying to think if there's been another Fargo episode that has been narrated like this. I couldn't recall one. Um, uh, but it, it did work because you're sort of trying to tie in what she's doing to these features. Yeah. No, I don't it seems like there could have been narration in a previous episode, but I'm not landing on any time when I know there was. Yeah. Um I did double check it about Jason's Jason Schwartzman as narrator. This is the first time that he has been the narrator. Um of course he played a character in a previous mm-hmm. season of Fargo. Um, I don't know if that, that spins out any theories for anyone or if it's just yep. like, hey, Noah Hawley kind of has his people. Yeah, and each, each season even sometimes loosely connects to others. Is that the connection? But as you said, what's then the theory of him saying this? How it's connected? I just, I, does it, I don't think it takes us anywhere. To, does right. it? To take, would it take us anywhere interesting to think Hey, what if this is the character he played doing the narration somehow? I, I don't know that that really takes. Why? Why would anything. that be the case? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. So probably it's just a matter of Noah Hawley kind of uh, having his people, which he does. He is one of those, um, you know, creators, directors, or whatever who seems to get relationships going with actors and then find ways to get them into. Um, future projects and stuff yep. like that. Yeah. Um, like we were talking about Timothy Oliphant being in his alien show mm-hmm. also like the next day or something like that, that they cast uh, the guy who plays Wayne in, in this. Uh... Oh, I didn't see that. Interesting. Okay. Um, I'm, his name's um, eluding me at the moment. Oh, I yeah, will Wayne look is, it up there. David Rizdahl. David Riz- Rizdahl. David Rizdahl. Yeah. I want to say Andy Ristall for some reason. David Ristall. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't know that it goes anywhere, but worth noting that that is Jason Schwartzman uh doing the narration there. And who knows if we'll get more narration as we move forward or yeah. You know, that was interesting. Well, I, I liked it. I, I you know I may have wanted more more teeth on the tiger, but I thought I thought it worked well. Yeah, no much though. No munch though. I'm, I'm disappointed in the lack of munch. So hopefully we get more munch. More munch. Immediately. Yeah. I want to see what he's up to. Is he still taking a bath? Did his mom make him pancakes? 
<laughs> is his mom had to go out for more beer. Yeah, this what's going yeah. on there. Well, they have to. Well, next week is called the Tinder Trap. I guess speculate about what uh, what that will be about, but there's your title for next week: the Tinder Trap. Interesting. All right. Well, we'll be back next week to talk about the tender trap. I don't know what to, what what kind of trap's going to be tender, <laughs> or 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 is it tender like money? Ooh. Speaking of debt being a cage, yes, that yeah. could be it. Yeah. Interesting. Tender, okay. That's my guess. Okay. Um, then... But so we'll be back next week talking about episode six. Hopefully, you join us. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Please do like, subscribe, I don't know, leave a review uh, wherever you listen to the podcast, hopefully a positive one. Um, these also do show up on YouTube. If you prefer to use YouTube, um, follow the site on social media, search for TV Obsessive on uh, the various social media apps. If you're so inclined, <laughs> check out the website, tvobsessive.com. And um, yeah, we'll be back next week talking about Fargo. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Episode six next week. See you then.